Good afternoon to everybody. Thank you very much to be here. So it's a uh, real, I mean, today was a very, very hard day. <laughs> but uh, honestly, a great enthusiasm and great happiness. And, you know, it's a good way to continue the day. Why it's a good day to continue the day? Uh, it's a great honor for me today to introduce uh, to you four important people in the museum life all over the world, from four continents. And uh, in detail, we have uh, Dr. Catherine Folland uh, from uh, Naturhistorische Museum Vienne. Uh, we have Dr. Jeff Post from the Smithsonian Institution Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. We have uh, Analia Lanteri, Museum of La Plata, Paso del Bosque, Argentina. And we have Keniki Shinoda, uh, National Museum of Natural Science in Tokyo, Japan. So, uh, the idea was very simple, is, uh, you know, today you have seen, or probably, I hope you already seen part of our museum, it's a, li it's a little bit big, so maybe you didn't uh, found everything you want, but uh, uh, the idea was that uh, to get some, let's say, some more input from other museums, bigger museum, larger museum, <laughs> all over the world, uh, to understand how far we still are to get very level. You know, <laughs> you know this was exactly what, what I mean. Um, as you know, um, how I selected these uh, four guests. <laughs> this was one question yesterday that somebody, uh, it's very simple. Uh, we represent four continents, and these four museums are <laughs> among the 10 most important museums in the world in natural science. So I think it's a good excuse to invite them. So, <laughs> okay, I think it's time to start. Uh, and uh, I will start to introduce you Katrin Folland, Dr. Katrin Folland from Naturist Historisch Museum, Vienna. Uh, for her diploma at the University of Bayreuth, you know that we have in common this. I worked four years in Bayreuth, yes. This is why I select her. For her diploma at the University of Bayreuth, Germany, Catherine did a thesis on biocontrol of uh, ladybird. And for her PhD in biology from the University of Kiel, she worked on uh, with the Max Planck Institution uh, for Limnology and the National Institution for Amazon Research and in Amazon on the speciation processes. At the Potsdam, Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, she coordinated a project dealing with climate change and nature conservation. And at the Museum for Naturkunde in Berlin, Leibniz Institution for Evolution and Biodiversity Research, she was head of the research department, museum and society. Mm -hmm. Right now, Catherine is the director, general director of the Naturhistorische Museum in Vienna. Uh, her main research interest is interface between science and different public audience, including policy. She develops open science uh, strategically for the collections, the museum, and beyond, including citizen science, where she is active to employ integrative and reflective approaches. So, Catherine Folland, for you. Please, Catherine. Fabrizio, thank you very much for this uh, very nice introduction. And um, I must say I'm extremely honored to be here. So it's so yeah, fantastic to celebrate with you a, a new museum. Yeah, I'm coming from Vienna, from the Museum of Natural History. That is one of this, I would say, typical museums in Europe. All the larger museums are more or less founded in the 18th century. But now there are some new museums like yours. And I was thinking, what? What can we reflect? What can be perhaps a bit helpful for you? And I thought um, to talk about responsibilities of museums could be something interesting for you. And the responsibilities and the changing um, role of museums is also reflected in the new definition of ICOM, of the International Council of Museums. So there was, um, there was a proposition of a new definition some time ago but it was not accepted then by the General Assembly, and there was a fierce debate um, over two years. And now um, in, in Prague, November last year, a new, a new definition was released. And uh, the, the key 
point of debate was the rule of collections. Um, here's the new definition, and I mark green what is um, still in the definition, and I marked red what is a bit new. So museums like yours are still non-profit permanent, hopefully, and service of society. And then it's also interesting now research is in first place. Probably that's also interesting for a university museum. OK, collects, conserves, interprets, and exhibits tangible and intangible heritage. I think that's not new. Um, but to and demonstrate the openness to the public, the accessibility and inclusiveness, and also that museums should foster really diversity and sustainability, that is something which the museums are already doing since some time, but which is now also reflected in the um, definition. Also, all these approaches with regard to ethics and um, of participation is a bit new. And I'm very happy, I must say, that education and also enjoyment still is part of this new um, definition. When I started three years ago in um, the Museum of Natural History, I started also a participatory process with my the new colleagues to think about who we are and who want we to be in 10 years' time, what impact we would like to have in our society. And good luck, what um, came out more or less reflects that, what is also on the, on the entrance of the museum, the um, standing dem Reiche der Natur und seiner Erforschung, so for the kingdom of nature and on its um, research. And when we discussed our new mission and vision, we also oriented on the global sustainability goals, um, of course, and we also see that we are an interdisciplinary research institution. And I bet we also say we would like to have impact with regard to biodiversity and sustainability. Um, we are not an NGO, so we are in first place a scientific institution and we can provide a platform. And that is some, sometimes, I must say, it's very difficult because um, you are on the edge if we talk about climate change, for instance. And with regard of climate change, I must say, now we have some numbers because we started to look a bit deeper into our, our own climate balance. We won't be carbon neutral by 2030, um, but we already started to have solar panels and we have now an idea about our um, carbon dioxide footprint. So with this, I said um, collections are the most important thing. And if you talk about responsibilities, I um, start with the idea that we should know where our collections come from. So there are two periods which are critical. One is the Nazi regime that more or less is fixed in Austria. There's a law and most of the um, things are given back or there was a pathway. But what is now a new topic is that what is called colonial context. And if you compare Austria with countries like yeah, Belgium or Germany, it, it did not have this big colonies. But um, colonial context also means that the museums profited from yeah, this traveling which took place um, with all these expeditions. And here I, it's only one example. An easy example, by the way, it was um, there was a large expedition, the Novara expedition. There was a ship um, going around um, the whole world. And it is always on one hand a scientific endeavor, and on the other hand, it's always also economic interests. But there was um, the example of Andreas Reischek. He even wrote in his diary that he took the skulls of Maori, and um, there was dead. he would have been dead if the Maori would have fetched him. So it was clear it was already unjust in that time. So um, we did, and already before, colleagues did some research on the provenance, and they looked into all these diaries. And we had a ceremony to give back the skulls after the Republic of Austria, because all our 30 million objects belong to the Republic of Austria, um, agreed. So for me, that was um, a very good example because the research was also done together, together with persons from um, New Zealand and also somebody from um, Australia. So, so in this case, it was easy. There was joint research, a clear decision, and um, also our colleague from the anthropological department was invited to New Zealand, and it was some, some kind of healing. But there are other cases which are a bit more complicated, and we also have beetles, um, stones, and other objects also coming from this colonial context. And I think that is something we have to debate a bit more in detail. I was part of a commission in Austria, because Austria would like to have a law to have more clear criteria and when to give back something. 
And I personally think there are always different aims in the room. For instance, the Beatles was not forbidden to collect Beatles. Nobody was interested in Beatles. Um, and that time, I bet it was some kind of colonial context. Nowadays, these, uh, these Beatles, just as an example, are spread all over the world because one of the experts for Stephanie Needs, perhaps, is sitting in Berlin, the other in Cape Town, the third in Singapore. So people do research for biodiversity. To conserve biodiversity um, or research-based and um, conserve biodiversity is also a target of the Convention of Biological Diversity. So we have conflicting targets, and that is something um, I think we should explore more, more in detail. And for me, the interesting thing is that we are doing research together. And I think that is also the way we are doing research with um, Brazil, for instance, or to really foster this um, cooperations. Um, but it is something, um, if we think about our collections, we increasingly have to care, and that is also part of this global um, change um, we see. Something else, um, still we have to care for the physical um, collections, and that also makes a lot of work, even though I will talk a bit about digitalization. We have to care for the physical collections. And it's very hard to get stuff for this, um, for this permanent uh, work, I must say. I here wanted to show you one example. We're also doing research because this climate impact, also the climatic conditions change within the building. So it may become more humid or more dry or more, more um, hot. And that also impacts the distribution of insects. Sometimes you have um, paper fishes which have not been in the house before, or the cycles of the insects become faster. So that is also something we have to address. And also here, there are opportunities for um, international corporations. Yeah. We wanted to make our collections accessible digitally. And I like very much this figure. Um, because it shows my large yeah, vision of this open linked data. So it very much shows what data could be in museum objects. So there's only a crap. I don't know whether there's something like eyeball here in Italy. So there's um, a larger initiative, um, ball and barcode of life. Arbol is the Austrian barcode of life. So there's some kind of a digital library of genetic codes. And that means if you, for instance, go into the stomach of the crab and uh, the food of the crab was digitized before, you can analyze uh, food webs, you can also analyze waters and so on. So there's a big database that is one example of um, genetic information you have in species. We also have sometimes um, tissue um, from, spe from specimens, which we have in an own collection, which should, of course, be linked to the specific objects. Um, typically, you have more morphological um, data and information, sometimes even 3D scans or, or photos, of course not of each object because there are a lot of crabs. Um, it's also interesting if you have some automatic backbone with regard to geographical information because sometimes the name of countries change, of places change, of um, whatever is um, changing and you don't have to go to each of your own object but you have a nice database and an interface to a geographic system. Also you can follow some standards like Inspire for instance. Also, taxonomic information changes um, rapidly. So if there's this a link to a taxonomic backbone, it makes the um, life much easier. Also, species interaction data, diseases. I think um, COVID made it very clear that there's, um, we could, could provide data on um, what, uh, um, on bats, and that could be linked to um, the origin of the, of the disease, for instance, or ecological data and the data to the provenience. I heard in the morning that the, um, this museum will be one of the biggest here in, in Italy, so it might be interesting you also look into this code to become a member of this European research infrastructure. Because the idea of DISCO is um, to link all the European research collection, to make the access easier, to improve the standards, and so on. We just asked the Austrian government to become um, a member of, of this DISCO network or research infrastructure, which probably will be some kind of, of ERIC, just to think about. Yeah, you already mentioned it, responsibility you know, for collection and research. There's some, some overlap. So. 
Um, we developed a strategy for the museum. And strategy means not we open everything, but we um, want to be a bit more um, strategic and develop some kind of mind map. So in, in which areas it's for us interesting to become more open uh, with regard to the collections, of course, because it increases the scientific value, but also with regard to um, publications. But that also um, has some implications about our budgetary um, models because the publishers gain a lot also with um, open access. And that is something we are discussing, but it, of course, increases the visibility and it's also fairer because you can download publications all over all, but it changes also processes um, in the museum. Something um, which we also would like to um, emphasize that we also think about open innovation and citizen science. So open innovation in the way that we actively also look for stakeholders who can make use of the collections, which is not only research, but which can also be policy or education or industry, and to see what, what can be done, what examples um, can we provide. And you already mentioned it, um, citizen science is also an area um, we are exploring or we are fostering the idea that the normal public or people who are not professionally working in an institution also contribute to science. It's typically um, data, it's observations from birds, from butterflies, you know that, or some, some history. Um, but there's also a European network. And this project is one of the ones I, or I like the program from the Ministry of Research, Sparkling Science. And it's a program where school children or classes uh, can ask for money for a scientific project. And we have a project which is called White Love Crime. So the kids um, learn to identify in, in shoes or whatever, and whether there is something from um, white life, which is uh, a crime. And they also look in their uh, families or in their social networks, um, how is the awareness of this, because not everybody knows it. So um, citizen science is also an, um, a mean to be a bit more open and to include the broader public into scientific endeavors. I also want to show a picture of what we also do, because we also um, do also science communication in different areas. So we also have this very traditional showcases. They are also arranged in this, like in this museum, according to a pathway through the evolution of Earth and through the evolution um, of, you know, of, of life. But sometimes it's for the visitors very um, difficult to understand. And yeah, that's something um, we really can learn from you. And I was very impressed from by some of your examples to also show the, the processes um, of um, evolution of, of stones, um, for instance. Yeah, in the middle, you see our Deck 50, which is a rather new place where we also have this innovation hub, but we also go outside. And we also have these funny things like sleeping at night in the um, museum. Yeah, I have some 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 conclusions uh, for you or some discussion points. So um, key task which remain for all museums, I think, is all the care for the collections. And of course, you do research and you support research. And of course, you provide and we all do different interfaces um, for the publics. But I think we are now living in a in a world which changes more rapidly than than ever. We have climate change. We also have a war in Europe, which is extremely close close um, to to Austria. Also, we have um, also denial in science, even at the political level, which is um, stomach aching. Um, I must say. Also, if you look for the biodiversity crisis and climate change, and um, also the questions of global justice and inclusion get stronger, then that is, of course, important then to address questions of provenience or also of um, access and benefit sharing are much, much more intensive than before. So I, I would say, with all of you, what I saw today, I yeah, take it also as an opportunity. You're a new museum. You have um, a lot of things now to do, and you can develop things um, to become really relevant. Um, I think also very much for your local um, audience, but perhaps even beyond. And I must say all the best for you, and congratulations for all I have seen today. Thank you very much.
Right? Yes. Any questions for Catherine? I have a question. <laughs> Catherine, can you just uh, summarize, if it doesn't take much, uh, about the funding for your museum, which is DISC? <laughs> Do you understand me, right? Uh, if you can say. <laughs> Uh, there's a, a basic um, funding um, of the museum. So it, uh, the museum you saw the last building, um, it's uh, more than 200 years old, and it ha we have more about 300 um, persons who are 60 scientists. And yeah, so the, the funding is there part of is it part public um, funding? It's public has about 13 million euro. And now after COVID, now we have again some fees for the entrances. And in addition, there are some sponsoring, but uh, and the biggest point for research are projects. So we write applications for the European Union and for also the um, national foundations. Okay, so the main uh, input is uh, the, around 30 million before COVID from the country. From about 80% is public funding. 80% uh, is public. Uh, very clear, very clear. Okay. If there are no other, oh yeah. Uh, two. Bye. Yes. Good evening. Um, my question was about uh, the, um, the relationship of the, the Austrian people uh, with uh, the natural science and uh, subjects and uh, I don't know nature or paleontology, what is the relationship of Austrian people with these subjects? Well, um, There's a question. the Austrian people are very diverse, uh, perhaps in, in the first place. So there's um, this EU barometer, I don't know whether there's so some kind of European uh, questionnaire which compares the different countries. And uh, recently, or the last one, or I think that one is from the last years, so um, there's not too much interest in comparison to other countries um, in science in Austria. And that's for me always astonishing because there are some areas where Austria is extremely innovative. If you go for, um, yeah, the, 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 the society is very diverse. So there are also a lot of learned associations. So we have also a lot of volunteers in the museum. So their relationship to um, the, the objects and science is extremely strong. We also have um, a person who goes out and motivates people to look for paleontological um, findings in the Wiener Wald, for instance, and he gets a lot of resonance and, and response. And one, one thing is so what you know from research about citizen science and this um, inclusion or this relationship to science, it, it very much depends on your social surrounding. And what we as a museum try to do is to go out of this uh, the inner city where we are and to offer also things for, for kids a bit more remote or in, in areas which are socially um, yeah, more difficult. But um, I also think it's important that the many, the, all the school classes are coming. So um, the museum is full um, of, of kids which come as, as schools. If they don't come as parents, at least um, there's the opportunity to come as the schools. I don't know whether that answers your question. I think that's not like the Austrian person. Right. Thank you. Thank you. If uh, there are no other questions, yeah, Massimo. So. Hello, thanks for your, <coughs> for your presentation. So, um, in our museums, we have very, let's say, local, regional topics and approaches. Then we try to develop global views, uh, some of the problems, and you mentioned a few are global, and therefore we expect the vast majority, or at least a large number of museums all around the world will deal with those. Given that this uh, symposium is about continents, mm -hmm. what do you think is very European of your museum? So what a European museum can contribute to global uh, museums network? What do you think can be very typical of a, 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 a European museum that your museum brings? Mm -hmm. Two very easy questions. Eh? <laughs> My was much easier. <laughs> How much money? It's, 
it's not that typical museum. So it's in so far typical as it was built in this um, uh, in all the time of the in Enlightenment. Um, I would say, and it is um, something which, which is very strong not only in our museum but in, in Europe as, as a whole. It is also built like this museum is the journalistic museum, so it has also the natural sciences and the humanities, and that's a bit hard because um, you have in your name nature and humans, and their nature human relationship is something which is. Um, Currently, we have to discuss it a bit more in detail, I would say. Um, there was also a paper in science where I think um, that you um, also um, contributed somehow to see the collections as some, some global infrastructure um, to be open for everybody. And, and Europe is really uh, taking a lead um, on this, so it's um, the European Union and different countries really invest in some, a lot of things in some of this. Yeah, I think the, the idea of enlightenment is very typical. And it's also debated because, um, the, for instance, it's not only the CBD, there's also IPES, which is a science policy interface, and there are groups which um, deal with what is scientific knowledge in contrast to traditional knowledge or indigenous knowledge. Um, how, how can we deal with these different approaches? And that is sometimes also for us it's slightly difficult. So, and, um, the comparison with New Zealand was comparatively easy um, because it's based on science. So, um, literature was analyzed, the skies have been analyzed, after there was some fast, um, even genetic or more detailed methods have been possible. We also had, um, we also gave back skies to Hawaii. It was also nice. And then there suddenly comes something, yeah, I feel something about this, and that makes it a bit more difficult um, for us. So that is for, I'm still an open question, how to deal with these different knowledge systems. Okay, I think we should move on now, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you very much. Okay, so, okay, thanks. So the next uh, presentation is from Jeff Post, Washington. So Jeff Post received a Bachelor of Science degree in Geology and Chemistry from the University of Wisconsin, Plathville, and his PhD in Chemistry with special in Geochemistry from Arizona State University. Prior to joining the Department of Mineral Science at the Smithsonian Institution Museum of Natural History in 1984, he was a postdoctoral fellow for three years in the Department of Geological Science at Harvard University. He was chairman of the Department of Mineral Science in 1988-1994 and in 2014-2019, and from 1991 to 23, sorry, as curator in charge of the U.S. National Gems and Mineral Collection. Dr. Post was the lead creator of, for the giant Tannenberg Hooker Hall of Georgia Gems and Minerals that opened in 1997. He is currently president of the Mineralogical Society of America, and his area of research interests include mineralogy, geomology, and geochemistry. It's your turn. <laughs> exhibitions, but I can't say I've been involved in the opening of a whole new museum, and so this is a very major event in the museum world, and so it's a great honor to have been here, and we had a chance to walk through the museum this morning and then again this afternoon, and every time I looked, I saw something new, and it's just fabulous. It's going to take my head a long time to absorb all of the amazing objects that I've seen in this museum today. It's just a great experience. I'm also very pleased to have the opportunity to talk to you just a little bit about the museum where I've been working for almost the last 40 years, the Museum of Natural History at the Smithsonian Institution. And the Smithsonian Institution is a very special place. It's the largest museum research complex in the world. But it started, interestingly, 1846. Now, I realize here that doesn't sound like a very long time ago. In the United States, that's a pretty long time. But um, it started in 1846 because there was an Englishman named James Smithson. He was a geologist, a chemist, a mineralogist, actually. And when he died, he left his fortune to the government of the United States to establish an institution for the increase and diffusion of knowledge. 
And you can imagine it took our Congress about 10 years to think what that meant. It was not a quick and easy decision. But finally, in 1846, they established the Smithsonian Institution. The picture here is the castle, the administration building, the first building of the Smithsonian. Well, the Smithsonian, since that time, has grown into a complex of 20 museums, the National Zoo, and also research stations around the world. And you might recognize some of the museums here. We have the New Museum of American Indian. We have um, Air and Space Museum, American History, all of these museums, most of them located in Washington, D.C. And you might recognize, um, looking at the left, the Washington Monument, if you've been to Washington, D.C. The far right, the United States Capitol Building. Been in the news a lot in the last few years. But in between, this big green area is called the National Mall. And along the buildings along both sides of that National Mall, most of them are museums that are part of the Smithsonian Institution. And the one that I'm going to focus on today, of course, is the Museum of Natural History. And that is the largest of all of the Smithsonian museums. The building we see here opened in 1910. And our Museum of Natural History, um, our basic mission, we're dedicated to the understanding of the natural world and our place in it. Again, the idea of the natural world and then how people fit into that. It is, as I said, the largest of the, of the museums, the Smithsonian. Um, it is a museum that as you walk in the building, you're going to be greeted there by our large uh, elephant. Um, his name is Henry. So I said, your, your large turtle, it needs a name. Yes, okay. And so Henry greets uh, our visitors on one side of the building, but coming in on the other side of the building, I'm very happy as a mineralogist to say, the first thing that our visitors see is this large 8,000 pound piece of quartz crystals from Arkansas. And so as a mineralogist, I'm very excited that our visitors come in and right away are being realizing that our solid earth is made in fact of minerals. And I think a great way to start people's thinking about the earth itself. So we have exhibitions in all the major areas of natural history. Um, of course, the Hope Diamond up on the upper right is kind of like our Mona Lisa. It's what a lot of people come into the building to see. But then we have various museums. We have a fairly new ocean hall, a brand new hall of dinosaurs, talking about the whole history of life on Earth, um, anthropological exhibits. And we welcome about six to seven million visitors per year into the museum. Now, I should tell you, admission is free of charge. So one of the things we're excited about is that anyone in the world can come into the museum free of charge and see the objects we have on display there. We also have a very strong education mission. This is one of the newer parts of our museum. It's called Curious. And it's a place where we have collections that are available for the public to have a hands-on experience. School groups, families, kids can come in working with scientists at the museum, with our volunteers, with our educators. And they're all different areas, topics, that they have a chance to actually look at collections, work on them, and have a bit of an experience of what it's like to be in a natural history museum. Oh, oops, back up one. There we go. And as we've heard, collections are one of the major responsibilities of being a natural history museum. We have the largest collections for the Smithsonian. We have 150 million objects that are part of the collections at the Museum of Natural History. Everything from, you see, butterflies to birds to minerals to various biological collections, anthropological collections. And these, of course, are in the part of the building that the public almost never sees. We have a small percentage of these on public exhibition. We try to keep our best, most spectacular objects on exhibit. But the public, of course, doesn't appreciate the 150 million objects that are behind the scenes. And along with those collections, all of the researchers that are part of the Museum of Natural History. So being a natural history museum, we have research departments, science departments in all the major areas of natural history. So you see here anthropology, botany, entomology, invertebrate, vertebrate zoology, paleobiology, and of course, mineral sciences. And so I, because I've spent most of my career working in the Department of Mineral Sciences, I'm going to take you into that department to give you just an idea of what our science departments are like. So typically, our science departments 
are made up of researchers. Um, we have scientists that are part of the staff there, but then we also have postdocs and interns and visiting scientists, students that all make up the research community in the building. We have approximately about 400 researchers, research scientists, uh, people doing research in our Museum of Natural History at any given time. And you'll see here we have laboratories, fortunately very state-of-the-art, some great equipment, a great place to do research. Of course, you see the collections in our Department of Mineral Sciences. We have our gem and mineral collection. We have the rock and ore collection. Also our meteorite collection, which includes the Antarctic meteorites. And the thing about these collections is that it's great to be there and work on them, but really our responsibility is to grow these collections, to curate them, and then most importantly, make them available to scientists anywhere in the world that need to have access to them, either coming to visit us to work on them, or we will send them samples from our collection. And this has one been one of our biggest responsibilities, is to make sure that these collections are fully accessible, available for research. And of course, not just now, but in the future. Um, one of our, you know, in museums, we're always thinking, we say museum time basically goes on forever. And so we're thinking about collections, not just in terms of what they are doing now, but the importance they will have in the future. We fully believe that there will be new questions. You know, when I started my research career, we weren't talking about climate change. And now it's become one of the most important questions in the earth sciences. And so people are looking at our collections in whole different ways now than they did 30 or 40 years ago. And we have to believe that 100 years from now, 500 years from now, that'll be the same idea. New questions, different instrumentation, hopefully smarter people who are studying these things. And so part of our job is to make sure these collections are available and accessible for those kinds of studies in the future. So we've heard, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways to talk about why natural history museums. And I guess, you know, for, for, a lot of, for a lot of my time at the Natural History Museum and a lot of the focus that we've had is thinking about that very question. Why are we doing what we're doing? Why are we putting out public exhibitions? Why are we showing these things to the public? And I think the major answer for us is we want to inform people about, of course, our planet to guide decisions and actions that affect our future. Where do people get information these days about our world? <coughs> You know, there's the internet, there's, you can go on TikTok, you can go on all kinds of places, social media, to get all kinds of information. But how do you know how good that information is? How do you know how to assess that information? And our job as a natural history museum is to provide information that is accurate, that is accessible, that is something that people coming into the museum realize is non-political, non-biased, it's information that they can learn, use to learn about the world in which they live. And I think there are not a lot of places where that can happen these days. Of course, also to build and preserve collections for research now and into the future, as we talked about. Showing people the real things. I think that's what we do best more than anything. You know, where do people see objects these days? They see them on their phones. You know, you're looking at pictures all the time on your phones. You're looking at them on the internet, on computer screens. Walking into a natural history museum, the thing that you see, like this morning when you walk in, you're seeing real things. You're seeing the real fossils in three dimensions, not just flat, three dimensions. You're seeing the real minerals. You're seeing the anthropological objects. And I think for all of us as humans, we still respond in a very emotional way to seeing the real things. I don't want to see a picture of the Mona Lisa. I want to see the Mona Lisa. I don't want to see a picture of the Hope Diamond. I want to see the Hope Diamond. I don't want to see a picture of a turtle. I want to see the real turtle, right? And so we have this emotional response. And psychologists talk about this sense of awe. It's a really, when we see something that impresses us, that is different, that's unusual, that's interesting, there's a sense of awe that we can share with each other, a family, a group of us. And when you have, when you're experiencing this emotion, this sense of awe, you suddenly are interested. You want to know what is this thing? I'm curious, now I want to know what it is. And so I think one of the great opportunities we have as a natural history museum is to show the real thing. And it's no coincidence, I think, that natural history museums have never been busier. We have more people now than we've ever had coming to our museums because I think they do want to see these real things. They want to get the real information. And the objects have the power to do that, to make people feel excited. And so, for example, I'm going to use, again, because my background, minerals, gems, crystals, I'm going to 
but there are so many examples. This is what our Hope Diamond Gallery looks like almost every day. We have 10 to 20,000 people a day that walk into this gallery because they want to see the Hope Diamond. They don't want to see a picture of it. They want to see a replica. And they always ask the guards. The first question is, is that the real Hope Diamond? And the answer is, yes, it is the real thing. And so this is what they come to see. And so we can tell a story. And the great thing about the Hope Diamond is it has a great science story. It's a natural history story. It has a human story. And so there are something for everybody to get a little bit excited about this one diamond. And then, of course, we have the gem collection. This is what our gem collection looks like right now. We've got crystals and we've got all of these things, again, that have a story about coming out of the earth, but also about the people who are involved with them. Some of them are good stories. Some are complicated stories. But they're stories that we can try to help people. And then they get to our mineral galleries. And of course, you've, got, you've seen today here, I hope you've seen some really spectacular minerals. And you'll, so you'll know what I'm talking about. When people walk into the mineral gallery, it's a very interesting experience for me because most people kind of know what gems are. They kind of know where they came from. They know that people have had to cut them, polish them. They've been involved. But when they see mineral crystals like these, mineral specimens, and we're telling them, and the first thing we're telling them is, these came out of the earth just like this. This is the way they were made naturally. And people look at you like you're crazy because they've never imagined things like this coming out of the earth. And so suddenly they're feeling this sense of awe, this emotion about, oh my gosh. And now they want to know what are these things. And suddenly the earth seems just a little more magical, right? And you know, one of the questions that we're always, to, when we, we plan or we propose a new exhibition at the museum, the first question that we always have to answer is, so how will this change people? Why are you doing this exhibit? It's not just to show off things. How will this make people coming into that exhibit different when they walk out? And I honestly believe that when people, when I'm out there, I'm watching people as they're experiencing the minerals in this case. Again, there are many other objects in the museum. I'm just focusing on the mineral. But the minerals are like a new discovery for people. They've never seen things like this before. They're beautiful things. They came out of the earth. They're natural. They're feeling this sense of awe. They want to know what they are. And I think suddenly the earth is an interesting place. Science is a little more interesting. And they walk out of there being surprised, feeling like I've never thought about something like this before. And I think we've changed a lot of people as a result of that. And interestingly, when we do surveys, we ask people, what is it you most remember about your visit to the Natural History Museum of all the things? Number one on the list, time after time, is the mineral collection. Much to my director's chagrin, dinosaurs are number two often. <laughs> but, but I think it's because it's a surprise to people. They're seeing things they did not expect to see, and that's what museums like this one does so well. You, every round, every corner is a surprise. It's something I did not expect to see, and therefore I now want to know what this is. I want to learn about it. And so we are so excited, I am so excited, to have seen this museum, so thrilled to be invited here to be part of this celebration today. I've seen many wonderful things today that have given me a sense of awe that I will fully appreciate, have changed me, and I thank you for that opportunity. And I think you're going to be so, millions of people over time are going to see this, see this museum and are going to be changed, will be different because of the experience they've had here. And so we want to say from the Smithsonian also, congratulations. We are so excited that there's a new natural history museum in the world, and it's beautifully done. Thank you so much. Really thanks, Jeff. Really thanks, dear thanks. So, some questions for Jeff. Do you have the Hope Diamond with you here? Uh, <laughs> I no, hope. I thought about it, and then uh, there's so many people back there that would be okay. so unhappy if it was here. But, uh, <laughs> but you don't need it. You have other things here. Right. One question. Uh, I can use this one. Ah, okay. <laughs> you mentioned that people is interested to see 3D, 3D objects, yeah. uh, real objects. What about uh, digital 3D, usage of digital 3D oh. in, into these museums? Yeah. Well, obviously, our exhibitions are just the beginning of the story that we try to tell. And so there are so many opportunities to share information about our collections, about the research that we're doing, that, you know, extend the visit of visitors. 
And so, I mean, there are many people that will never get to Washington, D.C., but we can start to share some of our collections through the various kinds of digital, 3D, all. And if you start looking online, you'll see that there are various ways that already different parts of our museum are being shown that way. And I think we're all exploring what is the right way, what is the best way to do that. And I think that as we continue to learn from that, it'll get better and better. And these objects will become um, much more accessible. But I think I'm still a believer that no matter how many times you see it in three dimensions on the internet or on a computer screen, when you stand in front of the real thing, it still will be a very different experience for you. So hopefully you get both experiences. That's a very important point because you know many of us now are thinking about what to do with the 3D scan and get available this because we clearly wonder this will stop people coming to the museum because they have yeah. at home or not. I don't think they will stop. Yeah. Okay. I think it'll make them want to come even more. Yeah, probably, yes. Yeah. Any other question for Jeff? Thank you very much for your presentation. I was really interested in when you mentioned that objects can tell stories, of course they do, and um, I wonder whether you can tell us something more about who, how you tell these stories, because of course part of the story is, and the content of the story mm -hmm. is written by researchers, but yeah. at the same time the way in which you tell the story is equally important. Yeah. So uh, are you collaborating with uh, storytelling experts or how do you, uh, do you develop the narrative thread within yeah. your museum? Thank you. Yeah, no, that's, that's always an ongoing conversation, right? We're always trying to learn. And part of it is, you know, we open an exhibition and we've worked with educators and writers and we've done focus groups and we've talked to people and we hope that we're telling, telling people something that will be relevant and interesting to them. Because... You know, for, we realize that for our, you know, the Smithsonian Museum, people come to Washington, D.C., and they go, I'm going to see the Smithsonian today, you know, and so obviously they can't see everything, and so they don't spend all day in our museum. It's a short visit, and so we have to think about who our visitors are and how do we convey information to those visitors. Now, and so what we've ended up, you know, for many of our exhibits, it's, it's a layers of information. There's sort of a very basic, here's what this is, why it's important, that we continue to learn. You know, as we get feedback from visitors, we may have to change things, update them. Um, but a very simple message, what is the important message? But then there is more detail, and we try to show that visually. Some might be there's videos, there's, you can do a QR code with your phone and get more information, uh, follow up your visit. There are a lot of ways that we can try to do that. Every object is a little different in a way. You know, like when people are seeing the Hope Diamond, for example, they want to know right then and there why that's so important. And so we have to have some information for them, but then there's whole books written about it. They can go and read more about it if they want to. So it's, it's, it's something we continue to learn. You know, we, we try to, but I think the important thing is, at least for us, is to let the objects tell the story as much as possible to keep the number of words that we put on the wall to a minimum because people don't want to read a lot of words, but they want to read a little bit. And when they've gotten excited, they go, that's a really amazing thing. They want to read immediately what that thing is. And then there's maybe ways they can get more information, but a simple answer to the question of what that thing is and why it's important, I think, becomes really important. Because if people don't read it, then what's the point? No. Okay, so some other question or otherwise, uh, okay? Thank you very much, Thank Jeff. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Congratulations. Good. Very interesting, yeah. Okay, so the next uh, presentation will be by Analia Lanteri, Museum of La Plata, Paseo del Bosque, Argentina. It's around 60 kilometers from uh, Buenos Aires, right? Good. Analisa Lanteri completed her higher, higher education at the Faculty of Natural Science and Museum of National University of La Plata. She obtained a bachelor's degree in zoology and a PhD in natural science. She carried out postdoctoral studies in the United States at the National Museum of Natural History and at Florida Agriculture and Mechanical University. Uh, as a research fellow of the National Council for Scientific Research of Argentina as Smithsonian Institution, by, by the way. <laughs> she was professor of taxonomy at the Faculty of Natural Science and the head of the entomology department of the Museum of La Plata 2010-2018. And since 2018, she is director of the institution. So please, Analia, this is your turn.
Thank you, Fabricio, for all your work to bring us uh, to this place. We are very proud to, to be here. Uh, this is a beautiful museum you have inaugurated, uh, and we are very happy to share this. And I am also happy to share this moment with this audience and with these important uh, directors of other museums of the world. Um, I will tell us something about uh, our museum that perhaps for many of you are not so well known as the Smithsonian that every, everybody knows. Um, uh, our museum has um, uh, some uh, unusual characteristics that is, uh, was conceived as part of a new city. The city and the museum uh, were born uh, all together um, because La Plata city uh, was planned and, uh, as a new city that would be the capital of Buenos Aires province. And then uh, the Buenos Aires city became the federal district. And, and then the, all the uh, buildings of the city were planned. And, and by then, uh, more than half of the population of La Plata uh, were composed of uh, immigrants from Italy. And then La Plata Museum and all the main buildings of my city were uh, uh, part of the work of uh, Italian workers. Uh, during the uh, 21st years, uh, La Plata, uh, the Museum of La Plata was a provincial museum. And after that, uh, it became a part of the National uh, University of La Plata. This is the first director and the creator of our museum. Uh, it was a, a man called Francisco Pascasio Moreno. He who was a, a young boy at the age of eight, exciting, um, forming a, a small collection uh, of uh, minerals, rocks, fossils, uh, animals, plants, and some pieces of human cultures of our territory. And later, he had the ability to convince the politicians to build a museum in a new city. And he donated uh, 15,000 pieces and his library to start with this museum. He was the director for almost 20 years. Uh, this is uh, the aerial views of the museum that uh, an oval uh, shape uh, that according to the creator uh, is because the, they symbolize the evolution that is uh, like a round and a spiral that have no end. And the museum is the midst of a green park of the city that is called Paseo del Bosque that was planned and, uh, by uh, an Italian botanist, Carlo Luigi Spegazzini. Uh, the botany in Argentina started with this Italian naturalist. And um, he not only um, designed this part, but also he started with our botanical collections. This is a view of our building that is of neoclassical style and since uh, 1997 is a national historical monument. It was designed by two European architects, Henry Haber for Sweden and Karl Heinemann for Germany. Uh, you can see uh, the, oh, hmm, the staircase flanked by, by uh, two smilodons. At uh, the tympanos, uh, there is an Hellenic sculpture that symbolizes the triumph of science. And on each side of the, fa the main facade, uh, 
uh, there are busts of uh, the main naturalists from the 80s and 19th century. These are some details of these uh, sculptures that ma were made by a uh, um, Venetian sculptor, Victor de Bol, who made several works in Argentina for public spaces, such as the Quadriga of the National Congress. Uh, this way you see Italians how important have been uh, the immigrants in our country because they started new lines of riches where we didn't have uh, anything. Um, and another characteristic of uh, our museum is that this uh, decoration of uh, um, inspire in American Indian cultures. The atrium, uh, the main rotundas, and every uh, hall are decorated by uh, motifs of these cultures from Mesoamerica. Uh, like Mayan and Aztec, uh, from uh, Peruvian cultures, in Inca and pre-Inca, and also from Argentina, like Mapuche and Diaguita cultures. Um, they are empire in some pieces of textiles and, and uh, um, metallurgy, and also ceramics. This is a view our, uh, of our rotundas. In the center, there is a, um, the, a bust of um, uh, Perito Moreno, Francisco Moreno, uh, in uh, white marble. Uh, and you can see all the decoration. And on the walls, you ha we have some paintings that represent la landscapes from Argentina. Uh, Mm, there is also uh, some of uh, them with uh, extinct and present fauna from Argentina, and also the uh, scenes of the American Indians that live in the country. Uh, this, uh, the last, the, the two paintings on the lower part are not uh, mural paintings, but are a part of our art museum. The, you can see the Iwasu Falls, perhaps you have heard about them, uh, and the uh, typical market. All of these paintings were done mainly by European painters. We have also a very good um, uh, collection of the Jesuit Guarani collections, the missions uh, that were the Jesuit um, had in Paraguay and Northeastern Argentina. And we also have some uh, uh, sculptures of fauna, native fauna from Argentina. And now our uh, artistic expressions uh, are made mainly by uh, our photographer that is inspired in feathers and, and shells, and they uh, work a lot for the event uh, museums at midnight with this mapping on the skeletons. And also we have very good uh, scientific illustrators. And some artists come to the museum, painters from different parts of the country, to, to be inspired by, by our pieces. And uh, they, they are producing very very nice art pieces. And well, the recent collections, uh, we now have about three million pieces, uh, but uh, uh, about two million are insects. <laughs> insects are very large collection. They represent mainly the fauna from South America. Um, we have the geological collections, um, with the uh, uh, meteorites, minerals, rocks of different kinds. This is the largest meteorite uh, collected by Francisco Moreno. 
uh, most of our geologists work on uh, mining and also for, uh, for exploration of uh, hydrocarbons so that they should change because you know, you know the clean source of um, uh, uh, energy and part of uh, the climatic change. But now they are working. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, our herbarium is very good, uh, and the digitization of the uh, herbarium is uh, quite advanced and is online. Um, and they uh, work with several, uh, not, not only technicians, but also students are part of this process. We have also a barrier of algae. Uh, our researchers work in uh, the uh, seas of Patagonia and also in Antarctica, and also uh, work on fresh water um, of our rivers in algae that uh, are growing uh, very much with the drought. You can see a green water because of the cyanobacteria. Um, and they also have a, a live uh, collection of algae uh, for molecular studies. Uh, we are involved in eyeball pro uh, project. Um, and this is uh, the house uh, at the corner that uh, Spegazzini donated to the National University of La Plata. He was very generous. Uh, in this house, we preserved the collection of uh, fungi and, um, and lichens and his library, some instruments he used, and this huge um, cactus he planted in an uh, in a backyard of the house, and it's a, a holotype. <laughs> and well, in paleontology, we also have two Italian naturalists, uh, Florentino Ameghino, that was controversial because uh, of his ideas about the origin of humankind. In, in South America it was wrong, but even though he uh, described several fam uh, species of the megafauna, and uh, he did a uh, great work. Uh, another one was Joaquin Frangueli from Rome. Uh, he was a paleobotanist, and uh, also he studied uh, in paleo invertebrates. In our collections, uh, we have a very good uh, collection of trilobites. We have a fossil good from Patagonia. And we probably have the best collection of uh, vertebrate fossils uh, in the world from Antarctica. Because uh, the expedition to Antarctica started in the 60s of the last century and continues every, every year. And, and then we have a very good collection from Antarctica. Uh, recently have been invited by the National History Museum of Paris uh, to, to do uh, um, an, a temporary exhibition of Antarctica uh, there. Um, and it, this is uh, perhaps our best collection and, uh, of uh, megafauna from from South America with several glyptodons, toxodons, mastodons. Um, Macrocania is like a camelid, but it's not. It belongs to another order. Uh, it's a megatherium, and, and the, the exhibition uh, is only a little part of the, the uh, skeletons we have in our deposits. In zoology, uh, we only we not only uh, study taxonomy, but now we are uh, studying problems uh, d uh, dealing with uh, invasive species like uh, the uh, golden mussel that was introduced from Asia, and is uh, we haven't 
a lot of problems in, in uh, tubes, in pipes or dumps because of, of these uh, muscles. And also, we, this little frog you see uh, is uh, endemic in, in a place of uh, Patagonia and uh, it was vulnerable and then was raised uh, in captivity in our museum in reintroduced in, in its natural environment. The mollusk collection is also very good and, and we have uh, several archaeologists and anthropology uh, uh, within the anthropology, the, the largest group is the archaeologists uh, that are working in all the areas on our territory and also in Peru, Bolivia, and some border countries. You can see a man uh, that is having something like an iron in, in his hands, and this is a portable scanner. He's uh, scanning this uh, piece of uh, ceramics, and uh, in this uh, uh, division, uh, uh, scientific division of uh, archaeology, uh, we are also uh, very advanced in digitization of, of uh, pieces. Um, and some icon iconic pieces of the Argentine, Argentine archaeology are the supplicants. These uh, stone sculptures that represent, represent unreal beings with anthropomorphic and zoomorphic features. Many people throughout the world when uh, come to the Museum of La Plata ask to see these, uh, these uh, sculptures uh, that are considered uh, excellence uh, of uh, the um, Indian American art. And also we have uh, this plaque of bronze, uh, 16 uh, centimeters long, that we call Caile of Lafon Quevedo. Uh, Lafon Quevedo was the second director of the museum, and both uh, come uh, from Catamarca, that is in the no northwestern uh, Argentina. Okay, the exhibitions, well, we have 20 uh, permanent um, exhibitions. Uh, we have a um, similar uh, idea regarding the exhibition that di this new mu museum, because we start with the, the Earth, the, the uh, solar system, and then the, all the, the geological collections, and then the paleontology, zoology, and in the upper floor, we have all the, uh, the exhibition room and that de deal with, with uh, humans, um, except an Egyptian room. I will talk about this. Uh, we um, uh, receive about 40, 000, uh, for, uh, 400 and thousand visitors a year. Um, the education uh, activities are in charge of uh, undergraduate students and graduate students of our faculty that are paid as a, a teaching assistants for this uh, role. And we receive a lot of families, uh, especially during the weekends, and um, schools during the weekdays and groups of tourists from all over the world. We organize conferences, workshops, scientific meetings, art, art exhibitions, choral events, education and recreational activities, uh, and some of them uh, are devoted to disabled people. Uh, just uh, some pictures of the uh, main exhibitions, for example, you can see at uh, the, uh, the upper corner um, the, um, the uh, room, the, the exhibition of uh, comparative zoology uh, with uh, several uh, skeletons, some of them hanging from the ceiling, um, and, and a great scale of a blue whale 
that is more than six meters long. Uh, this whale was found in Buenos Aires province, uh, ground in, the, uh, in a beach. Um, um, well, we yeah, and in and the lower part of uh, the, this view, we have the ethnography exhibition and the um, uh, Latin American archaeology exhibition. When we found um, an, a replica at a real scale of a, a gate of the sun from Tiahuanaco in Bolivia, and a lot of ceramics from Peruvian origin. And we have a, a, a room devoted to the uh, Egypt because Argent uh, the muse our museum participated in an, the archaeological rescue expedition carried out between 1961 and 1963 before the construction of the Ashwan Dam. And uh, in recognition to this expedition, the government of Sudan do donated these uh, pieces and that uh, exhibited in, in our museum. And we also have two sarcophagi with funerar funerary inscriptions and their mummies uh, that were donated to the museum uh, by the founder of uh, La, uh, la, the city of La Plata. And we have uh, done studies of uh, computed tomography on these mummies. And finally, well, our museum, and I think uh, uh, many museums throughout the world, are becoming uh, community meeting places uh, for these uh, different kind of activities. Uh, uh, we have a festival every year we call Corosaurus, for the chorus from uh, different places in uh, of La Plata and surrounding. We have the museum <coughs> at moon, moon night and several activities for uh, mm, all the diversities and ages. Um, uh, we have uh, a room for um, interactive activities with, with children from schools or, or families, and um, for blind people, uh, for um, for example, uh, uh, this uh, boy uh, in, a, in a bed is in a hospital, the main hospital of La Plata, that is the main hospital for children in Buenos Aires province, and the, the, our guys used to go there uh, to teach and uh, to interact with the, with these children that cannot come to our museum. And probably in a few weeks we will have our winter, winter vacation and we will have a long line of people trying to go into the museum for several activities. Uh, even though they are used to um, interact with uh, social media and different, uh, uh, especially after the pandemic, but uh, people are, are coming, as uh, Jeff said a moment ago, they want to see the real things and they want to interact with other people to learn and they ask questions, uh, and uh, I think um, the Natural History Museum have uh, an important role uh, to do in, in the next years, um, because uh, as Catherine said, uh, ICOM said, uh, well, we have to uh, be uh, uh, part of this uh, education process uh, in favor of the conservation of nature and also the respect for all peoples and all, nat all cultures uh, throughout the world. Um, and then um, it's, it's very good that we have in Pad Padua uh, a new natural history museum. Uh, if we can cooperate, it's, it's very important. 
because we will do more for, for our societies. Thank you very much and congratulations. Thank you very much, Analia. Any question for Analia? We only have two questions possible. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, mm, I just um, have a, a short question. Uh, maybe everybody knows uh, what happens in um, Pete Rivers Museum in Oxford when after the COVID they have to change and they have to hide uh, the, um, the stricken uh, heads because of the sensibility. So my question about uh, your museum is if uh, have you changed something in your museum because because of the um, attitude, because of the um, decolonization process. So this is because maybe, maybe not. Maybe is the same. Thank you. Uh, not is is not the same. We have changed. Um, we don't show uh, the uh, corpse of. Um, um, American Indians from our territory because they they feel that uh, they they, did, they didn't feel comfortable ab about that uh, and uh, they were moved in, in 2006 uh, from there to our deposit and then they identify. Uh, re remains that are in collections of human remains are uh, returned to the communities. Uh, yes, this is an, a new, a new uh, politics uh, from the university. This is something that we will face sooner or later. It actually is under discussion. Yeah. Some other question? Okay, so I didn't, oh, sorry, I didn't please. say anything about you said that, that how we found our. I can say something if you wish. Oh, yeah, you can. <laughs> no, Shortly. we are a, a university museum. Our main founding comes from the university and then from, from the state. Uh, we have uh, support some private foundations from the tickets and half the people pay the tickets have not because uh, ch uh, children and uh, school uh, children and students and retired people disabled people don't pay and also some companies uh, have a, a donation and uh, we apply to some grants from different sources yeah, so it's very well distributed, let's say. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Analia. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. So let's uh, let's move now to the. What is my paper? Did you take my paper? I think you took my paper. Probably <laughs> <laughs> one is mine. Sorry. Yes, one is mine. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to the last uh, presentation of the day. Uh, Dr. Keniki Shinoda, National Museum of Natural and Science, uh, Tokyo, Japan. So he got the educational background in Kyoto University and the PhD at Saga Medical School. Uh, it was where he was associate professor. So since 2003, he was employed by the Nation, National Museum of Nature and Science in Tokyo and, uh, and the head of the Department of Anthropology. So he's an anthropologist. In 2014, he was director of the Department of Anthropology and in 2021, he became the director of the National Museum of Nature and Science in Tokyo. So the Toshinoda is a molecular anthropologist and is a specialist of ancient DNA analysis. He conducted research on the origins of Japanese people using DNA, DNA analysis of ancient human bone. Welcome, and it's your turn. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for the invitation to the opening ceremony of the prestigious Padua University Museum. I am also great, grateful for the, to the opportunity to introduce our own museum. Now, I would like to give a brief description of our museum. Uh, in English, our museum is called the National Museum of Nature and Science, here. but uh, when directly translated from Japanese, it became the National Science Museum. Uh, it's a Chinese character, National Science Museum. Uh, this is intentionally changed uh, in the English name. Uh, to avoid confusion with museums focused solely on science and technology, uh, which is common in Europe and the United States. However, Japanese name is related to the historical establishment of our museum. Uh, Japan transitioned from the uh, feudal society uh, to the modern nation in 1868. On the third floor of this museum are the specimens from the uh, left side, uh, right, right side, yeah. Uh, please, please do not uh, misunderstand. We Japanese do not use such specimen now. We are now uh, modern Japanese. Uh, <laughs> during this period, it was necessary, necessary uh, to incorporate advanced science and technology uh, from Europe and the United States, and various organizations were created by uh, running from Western world. The museum was one of them, and from the beginning, it had uh, the purpose of educating the public about the advanced science of developed country. Uh, our museum was found in 1877. In the, sum, the same year, the first national university in Japan established. The image shown here is a ukiyo-e woodblock print from 1877, depicting our museum and surrounding area. Museum's first name was an educational museum. It is common in Asia uh, to create a museum of natural history and the history of science and technology with the aim of science education, which distinguishes them from the museum in Europe and America in terms of their origin and purpose. In front of the main building of our museum in Ueno, uh, there are monuments of a locomotive and a whale symbolizing the museum as a place of both industrial technology and natural history. However, after World War II, uh, our museum strengthened its character as a museum of natural history. I will explain later. Uh, currently, out of the five research departments, four are related to natural history. I believe uh, that the the purpose of any natural history museum is the same, and the mission of our museum is the, is the collection of specimens and the research based on them, the preservation of specimens, as well as the ex exhibition and educational activities. This slide shows the location of our museum consists of three regions. The main exhibition hall is located in Ueno, Tokyo, as I said before. And the natural education, uh, natural education garden is also in Tokyo. The storage building, research facilities, and botanical garden are located in Tsukuba City, Ibaragi Prefecture. The Ueno main building consists of the Japan Gallery and the Global Gallery. The Japan Gallery offers exhibition on the nature and history of the Japanese archipelago, uh, the process uh, by which the modern population of Japan was uh, form formed, and the history of the relationship between the Japanese people and the nature. It has three floors above ground, and the total floor area of 1,800 uh, square meters. And that 
テーマ of the Global Gallery is the history of life on Earth, which explores the deep interrelationships among the Earth's diverse living things. The evolution of life as environment changes divides drive a cycle of speciation and extinction, and the history of human ingenuity. It has three floors above ground and three floors underground, with a total floor area of uh, 12,000 square meters. A total of 20,000 specimens are displayed in the Venus Exhibition Hall. Sorry. The Institute, Institute of Nature Study is located in the center of Tokyo, uh, preserving the uh, nature of the past. Here, students and researchers can observe plants and animals in the wild and study the uh, working of the, their ecosystem. This is the slide. It's a place you cannot imagine being in the middle of the big city, Tokyo. This slide shows the Tsukuba Research Department and Botanical Garden. This area consists of the research building, storage, and botanical garden. Tsukuba and Ueno are about 60 kilometers apart, which pose a hindrance to the museum's activities. However, It is difficult to acquire a large piece of land in Tokyo, and if the number of collections increasing in the future, uh, we plan to expand, expand the Tsukuba area. Next, let me explain about the uh, research departments. The animal research department consists of 18 researchers, and it is divided into three divisions, about a b r e a d Uh, marine invertebrate and uh, terrestrial uh, invertebrate. The plants research department has 16 researchers and is also divided into three divisions uh, land plant and fungi and algae and plant diversity and c o s t conservation. The Our science department uh, consists of a department of the study rocks and minerals, a department that focuses on evolutionary research using fossils, and a department uh, that investigates past climate changes and ecology. In total, there are 13 researchers. The human research department is the smallest research department. I formerly belonged. Uh, this is 10 years before my uh, picture. It consists of five researchers who conduct research on human evolution and the origin of the Japanese. The engineering and technology research department used to have nearly 15 researchers, but currently there are eight researchers. It comprises two research divisions. One focusing on the history of science and technology, and the other con conducting research on physics, chemistry, and space. The specimens collection collected so far amount to approximately 5 million,、uh, with animals and plants accounting for about 90% of them. Currently, around 80,000 specimens are being collected and、uh, preserved annually. Prior to the outbreak of the COVID 19 pandemic,、uh, the annual number of visitors was approximately 2.5 million, which was the highest among museums in Japan. Due to the pandemic,、uh, there was a, a period of closure,、uh, causing a decrease of about 20%. Here. As a result,、uh, the financial situation of the museum. Uh, getting worse、uh, significantly, but it is gradually recovering.、Uh, visitor numbers have recently returned to the previous level. The annual operating budget of the museum is approximately 3 billion yen,、uh, it's about、uh, 20 million euros. 
uh, with about 20% generated from the self-generated income, and 80% is subsidized by the government. Expense uh, consists of 30% for personal cost, 20% for the maintenance of exhibition rooms, 12% for research, and 9% for specimen collection. However, considering the recent rise, rise in price, uh, the financial support from the government is not sufficient. Finally, I will summarize the issue in museum operation. Uh, first, a reduction in government funding. I hope Japanese government officials uh, listen to this presentation. <laughs> so, effort to acquire external funding have become increasingly important. And second, Recently, there has been a sharp increase in do donation requests for specimens collected by university research institutions and amateur collectors. So it is necessary to build a new uh, repository. Third, decreasing natural history researchers. Causes for training ex taxonomic expert at university are gradually disappearing in Japan. Museums need to foster such experts independently or in collaboration with the university. And since I have some time, uh, I will talk a little about my research. In 2014, uh, human bones were excavated from the construction site on an apartment building in Tokyo and they were brought to our research lab, uh, three bodies. These are three graves aligned in a straight line, uh, indicating they were buried simultaneously. About 300 years ago, uh, this was the site of a mansion where Christian missionaries were imprisoned by the Edo shogunate we decided to conduct DNA analysis on these skeletons. Analysis was succeeded on two out of, out of the three bodies, and the result revealed that one of them was Japanese. And, uh, but surprisingly, another is an Italian. According to record, uh, there was only one Italian imprisoned uh, in this mansion. <laughs> who, uh, mansion, uh, who did not know the location of his grave. Grave. It was determined that these human bodies belong to him. His name is Giovanni Shidotti. He's a person who is always mentioned in Japanese historical textbook, and he was the only person who told the situation in Europe, including science, during the, this period into Japanese. This is the construction of his appearance during his lifetime, based on the human body, the bones. These remains are preserved in our research lab now. Japan and Italy have had exchanged over 30, 300 years. I hope uh, that uh, the academic exchange will continue for a long time to come. Thank you for your attention. Really, thanks, uh, Toshinoda. Thank you very much for your presentation. There is, uh, we have time for questions, right? One, two. Two, <laughs> two <laughs> questions. Buonasera, Retrice. Benvenuta, Director. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering um, if you're using a digital exhibition in uh, your museum for differentiating the visiting experience among kids, adults, and senior visitors. Yeah. Sorry, I can't catch the question. Should I repeat the question? Yeah. Yeah. You said which is the the reaction? The, the reaction, reaction uh, if you show digi digitalized images uh, from uh, adult uh, child exhibition, exhibition. Digi digitalized exhibitions. Uh, it, it doesn't like. It's a bit difficult to <laughs> answer. Yeah. And, and the number of 
uh, visitors uh, different from the exhibition to exhibition. Uh, so uh, dinosaur and uh, animal and uh, mummy is a very large number of visitors come here. So it's very impressive to, for, for the audience and, and people. But uh, we must uh, do the, the other exhibition because what uh, we want to show the visitor is not the same with uh, what uh, the visitor want to see. So we need to think about the, this gap to, to cross that. Yeah. Yeah. Any other question? Okay, so really thanks to Toshinoda. I think that's so. Okay, so uh, really thanks um, so much for being here and uh, listening to us. And uh, thanks to our guests to be here and uh, to give a very uh, nice presentation about these museums and I hope we can collaborate in the future. Uh, I'm sure we will, because I will push on them, <laughs> as I usually do. <laughs> okay, so uh, now please uh, go around the museum, visit everything you can, and uh, we will meet soon, right? <laughs> okay, thank you very much, thank you to you.